What's up? I'm Van, and today I want to go through the 2007 AP Calc AB question six, no calculators. So for part A, we're trying to explain why there must be a value C between two and five such that F prime of C equals negative one. Now for questions like this, when you hear the phrase, there must be a value C, it's either going to be mean value theorem or intermediate value theorem. But the way that I know it's going to be mean value theorem is the fact that we're talking about F prime and we're given information here about the function F of X. So in order to use mean value theorem, you need to say first that your function is differentiable on the open interval and continuous on the closed interval. But they told us here that F is twice differentiable. So I could say, since F is twice differentiable, this means that F is also continuous. Now, once we say the function is differentiable and continuous, now we could use mean value theorem. So the way that's going to apply here, I could say by the mean value theorem, which we could abbreviate with MVT, there exists the value C. And there's a nice symbol. When I want to say there must be a value, I could use this symbol here, the backwards capital E. And this is accepted notation for the AP test. So this says there must be a value C, where C is between 2 and 5, such that F prime of C so this is the derivative at C, let me make this a little neater. So F prime of C is equal to the average rate of change of F of X on this interval. So the average rate of change would be F of five minus F of two over five minus two. And if we work this out, F of five they told us is equal to two minus F of two is equal to five. And this is being divided by five minus two. But if we work this out, this is negative three divided by positive three, which is gonna give us negative one. So this is gonna complete part A. Now, part B is a little bit tricky, and the reason why it's tricky is we have to use mean value theorem again, but this time we're applying it to the first derivative. So we're trying to show first that g prime of 2 is equal to g prime of 5. So we'll go ahead and do that first. So over here, we'll have, for this question here, we're going to find g prime of x, but notice they told us that g of x is equal to f of, whoops, too many. So we got f of f of x here like this. So g prime of x is equal to, we have to use the chain rule. We have f prime of f of x, but then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So here, if I want to show g prime of 2 equals g prime of 5, I'm just going to plug in. And g prime of 2 is going to give us f prime f of 2 times f prime of 2. And here, it may seem a little bit strange as to what we should do next, but remember, they told us that f of 2 is equal to 5. So g prime of 2, I could say, is f prime of 5 times f prime of 2. And now if we look for g prime of 5 next, this is going to tell us we're using, here's g of x again up here. So g prime of 5 is equal to f prime of f of 5 times f prime of 5. And now if we simplify this, this tells us that we have f prime of f of 5 is equal to 2 times f prime of 5. So how do we know g prime of 2 equals g prime of 5? Well, by commutativity of multiplication, see how they're both equal to f prime 5 time, times f prime 2, we could say here, so g prime of 2 is equal to g prime of 5. But now we're not done here. This is the first part. Show that this is true. But then we need to use this result to explain why there must be a value k between 2 and 5 such that g double prime of k is equal to 0. Now, what makes part b a little bit evil is that the mean value theorem usually starts off with some function f of x, and it's talking about f prime at some particular value. But here, we're applying the mean value theorem to g prime. So the way this is going to work here, we have to establish that g prime is a differentiable function. So we could say since f is twice differentiable, so we're starting off here, we have since f is twice differentiable, they told us that f was twice differentiable because if f is twice differentiable, that means that the function g prime is differentiable and continuous. So we could say here, since f is twice differentiable, g prime is differentiable and therefore continuous. So we could say all of this stuff here. Now on the rubrics, they don't necessarily take off points all the time if you forget to mention that your function is differentiable and continuous, but I just think it's sloppy. So we're going to say g prime is differentiable and therefore also continuous. So now we're just going to apply the mean value theorem to g prime. So we could say here by the mean value theorem, 
there exists, and we'll use the letters they want. They want us to use the letter K. So there exists a value K, where K is between, whoops, is between two and five. So let's just fix this. So between two and five, such that G double prime of K, and remember this detail, we don't have to write it in our explanation here, but just know we are, we're applying this. So we're applying this to the function G prime. Okay, we're not applying this to G, we're applying it to G prime. So to finish out this explanation by MVT, there exists a value K such that G double prime of K is equal to G prime of five minus G prime of two over five minus two. But remember what we just said before. We said we showed that G prime of two is equal to G prime of five. So if we subtract equal things from each other, we're gonna have zero in the numerator and three in the denominator which tells us that G double prime of K is going to equal zero at some point over this interval. So now for part C, and I'm just gonna assume you got everything copied here, I'll just add another page. So we'll move on now to part C. We wanna show that if F double prime of X equals zero for all X, then the graph of G does not have a point of inflection. So these questions can be a little bit tricky, but just know if G doesn't have a point of inflection, what we're really trying to show is that G double prime does not change signs okay so like that's kind of like guiding what i'm going to look for so we're trying to show that g double prime does not change signs assuming f double prime is equal to zero so that means i have to look for g double prime of x remember what we said before g prime of x we had written in part b is equal to f prime of f of x times f prime of x so here to find g double prime of x i have to use the product rule and in the process of using the product rule, I also have to use the chain rule. So this is the piece I have to be the most careful with. The derivative of f prime of f of x is f double prime of f of x. So I'm doing the derivative of the outside and I'm keeping the inside, but then times the derivative of f is still f prime. So that's this times the other function f prime. And now we have plus, and I'll write it over here, plus we have f prime of f of x times the derivative of f prime is f double prime of x. But now we have to think about what we could assume. f double prime is equal to zero for all x. So I could say since f double prime of x equals zero for all x, this tells us that g double prime of x is equal to, well notice this piece here, you see we have f double prime of f. So that is automatically gonna turn to zero because f double prime is always equal to zero. So we have zero times f prime, f prime, plus we have f prime f of x times f double prime is always equal to zero. So this tells us g double prime of x is always equal to zero. But now we have to analyze this. Remember, how do we show something doesn't have a point of inflection? That would mean that g double prime does not change signs. So g double prime equals zero. Since g double prime equals zero for all x, that means g double prime doesn't change signs, so g doesn't have a point of inflection. Now, just in case we don't know this terminology here, the three dots like this is a symbol for therefore. Once again, this is something on the AP test this is notation that they do accept. So now we're just gonna move on to this last part here. So moving on to part D. In this scenario here, we're given information about H of X, and we wanna explain why there must be a value R between two and five, such that H of R is equal to zero. So in this scenario, I know I'm gonna be using intermediate value theorem, and the reason being, I was given information about H of X, and I wanna talk about the same function H of X. So that's how I know it's IVT and not mean value theorem. So here, what we could say here is that since F is differentiable, and I could write twice differentiable, but I don't need all of that extra information. But since F is differentiable, that means that H, H is differentiable and therefore also continuous. And remember, for therefore, I'll use these three dots. And therefore, H is also continuous. Now in the rubric, they don't necessarily count this as part of the points, but I think it's sloppy to use intermediate value theorem without mentioning the function is continuous. So now that we have this, 
Well, if we want to use intermediate value theorem, we need to evaluate h of x at the endpoints two and five. So this is going to be equal to f of two minus two. And remember, f of two is equal to five. So this is five minus two, which is equal to three. And then I'm going to evaluate h of x at the other endpoint. So I'm going to get f of five minus five. And this is going to give us two minus five, which is negative three. So since I'm trying to show that zero, the function reaches zero on this interval, this has to happen by the intermediate value theorem because zero is between negative three and positive three. There's no way to go from positive three to negative three without passing through zero, provided that your function is continuous. So we have since zero is between negative three and positive three, by the intermediate value theorem, I could say that there exists a value r, r is between two and five such that, and here's our conclusion, h of r is equal to zero. Okay, well this is going to conclude this video on the uh, 2007 AP free response question for AB question six. If this video was helpful, please like and subscribe. And if you got any requests, just leave the topics you want me to cover in the comment section below. And thanks for watching.